institutional and accredited investors need a way to custody their assets. The lack of cryptocurrency custodianship is one of the main reasons that we have not seen these investors take a greater interest in the digital asset space. Today, we will be hearing from Jermaine Harmon, an individual who worked in the traditional finance industry in roles related to foreign exchange, settlement, and back-end development before he began building a cryptocurrency and equity custodian product at Trust Chains. I'm your host, Patrick Thompson, and you're watching More Than Money. Today, I am here with Jermaine Harmon. Jermaine, how are you doing, man? I'm fantastic, Patrick. Good to see you again. It's good to see you too. So for those who don't know, can you give us a brief summary of who you are as well as your career history? Sure. Um, so my background is in the foreign exchange world. Um, I started off in the clearing um, and settlement side of foreign exchange uh, and then moved into technology, electronic trading, um, and more the front office uh, side of the business. Uh, most of my career has been spent um, at large companies like State Street, um, but also at smaller companies, startups, fintech startups. Um, I was in the private equity world for a while. Um, so I have a, a very broad background um, as it relates to the finance world. You have a, a, a vast experience working in finance. So what brought you to the world of blockchain and digital currencies? What really brought me to this world was a project I worked on uh, in 2015. Um, I was helping a company build a clearing and settlement bank for Latin America. Um, and we looked at integrating a crypto exchange into that bank. Um, now, I, th I think we ended up um, not doing it because I don't think the timing was right. Um, so that was my first kind of brush with crypto. Uh, and obviously, I found it very, very interesting. Um, and really got back into it when I saw that there was uh, the beginning, beginning of an institutional adoption of crypto. Uh, and that's what really got me focused on it. Given those previous experiences that you've had with the work that you've done, especially when it comes to Forex and things around settlement, do you see any similarities in the cryptocurrency markets? Absolutely. Um, I think the first thing that you'll see is a lot of the historical um, foreign exchange firms, large foreign exchange firms have moved into crypto. And the biggest reason is volatility. Um, there's not a lot of volatility in the foreign exchange market currently. Um, so you have a lot of these players moving into crypto because of that volatility. Uh, you also um, see that they have the infrastructure that's built for crypto. Um, they have cross connects and, and all this technology and infrastructure built out globally to be able to trade crypto on different exchanges, um, to be able to normalize data um, and, and generate revenue trading those, those new asset classes because they're moving so much. And it sounds like these institutions are very close to the point where they are enabling sort of crypto on ramps and off ramps or at least digital asset support this year has been a point when we've been we've uh begun to see a change we've seen more and more financial institutions at least say they see customer client interest in them but why has it taken them so long to accept it when they were probably the individuals in the best position to support cryptocurrency from the jump Great question. Um, and I and the answer is very, very simple for me. Um, and part of the reason um, I'm working at Trust Chains now, uh, a lot of these institutional players, they can't trade crypto, they can't hold crypto, because that crypto is not sitting in a very safe environment. Um, you can't have millions of dollars sitting on an exchange in offshore somewhere, um, self custody by the exchange, where you don't have access to the private keys, and then an, an exchange can shut down and walk away with all your assets. Uh, so I think for me, it's a safety and surety of those digital assets. Uh, and once that's in place, you'll see mass adoption uh, institutionally of the crypto world of digital assets themselves. You just mentioned trust chains, and I'm happy you did that because a lot of your time and energy 
goes into creating a custodian product that I believe supports uh, digital assets, cryptocurrencies, as well as equities. So can you tell us why the world needs custodians for assets, especially at the enterprise, institutional, and accredited investor level? We see custodians as the honest brokers of the financial system. Um, they provide the services that allow investors, institutional clients to have that surety and safety of their assets, right? Custodians are a class of companies that operate under a very strict regulatory oversight and regulatory regime, right? Um, so those entities, uh, qualified custodians, they deliver arm's length control of assets on behalf of the client. Right. They have a high degree of security, storage, possession of those assets. And that's very, very important in the digital asset and crypto asset space. And I call that legitimate custody because that's how assets should be custodied. But I guess the, in, in opposition to that, how do many uh, cryptocurrency companies or cryptocurrency exchanges, how do they, how do they custody their crypto assets today? Well, I, I think the first thing to understand is um, you will hear a term called self-custody, okay? Um, in my eyes, there's no such thing. So self-custody, what that is, is um, an exchange might say, oh, we self-custody assets, meaning they hold the private keys, they hold the assets, right? That's not custody because it's not a qualified custodian um, who has a fiduciary duty to protect your asset. They can do whatever they want in that asset and most of the time with that asset, and most of the time you don't have any recourse um, if something bad happens. And also you, a lot of the times you don't have the insurance you need to protect that asset. Um, so the majority of these firms, they do what is called self-custody, um, which is not the same thing as a qualified custodian. I'm just gonna call it a legitimate custodian much different than self-custodying assets. Why is it safer than self-custodying assets? Yeah, I think it, it goes back to that, um, the regulatory regime that the qualified custodian operates under. Um, and it's not just the regulatory regime, it's operationally um, qualified custodians have to have certain things in place. Um, I know the New York Department of Financial Services, um, as they look to um, expand what they're doing in the digital asset space from a regulatory standpoint, they're going to probably force most custodians to have some sort of cold storage or have um, the client's assets in cold storage. Um, because uh, as a qualified custodian, you have to have operational procedures in place to show the regulators um, that you're doing the most to protect your client's assets. Let's say a custodian got hacked or breached. How is that different than uh, a cryptocurrency exchange that self custody is getting hacked or breached? Sure. So number one, um, when we go back to procedures and what procedures the regulators force qualified custodians to have in place, they need to have procedures around if something like that happened. Um, they have to have disaster recovery in place, business continuity plans in place. And more importantly, it has to be transparent to the end client. The end client has to know if my funds are affected by a breach or a hack, this is what's going to happen to those funds. Um, so I think that's all a client wants is transparency. And then when you layer insurance on top of that, um, that gives them the, the stability they're looking for to be able to invest in the space and then know their assets are safe. Uh, that's true. That's when you'll get true institutional adoptions, uh, adoption, which I think will take um, the digital asset space even further. And something I wonder is if a bank is a qualified custodian, does this mean that they can automatically custody digital assets or do they need a sort of special license, registration or infrastructure so before they have the ability to custody cryptocurrencies? Yeah, I, th I think it's a little bit of both. First, it's what jurisdiction is that bank in? Um, what regulatory regime are they under? Um, you know, it, when it comes to digital assets, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that the regulatory environment is still a bit in, in the gray area. Um, so it de also depends on the risk appetite of the bank, right? Are they willing to um, uh, work within an environment that is not 
Um, that is a bit of a gray area when it comes to regulation. Um, it's also going to force that bank to invest more uh, in things like cold storage, right? In things to protect um, from a cybersecurity standpoint, uh, protect those digital assets. Uh, and those aren't decisions that are taken lightly um, by banks. And we hear the words cold storage or cold wallet and hot wallet get thrown out, thrown around quite a bit. So what does cold storage actually look like? And, and why is it so much more secure than a hot wallet? Yeah, so uh, cold storage is, is literally the physical storage of digital assets where there is no way they can be actually hacked and taken. Um, they're sitting in hardware in a secure facility um, that has redundancy in terms of um, that asset. Uh, so it gives you the ultimate security that there's no way that digital currency or that digital asset can be hacked and taken because it's not connected to the internet. Opposed to the hot wallet, which is connected to the internet. It, exactly, exactly. Uh, now, now, you you know, to, to trade a digital currency, to trade crypto, to generate revenue, um, you you have to trade it. You have to move it around, right? So um, what, what is big in the industry now is how do you move assets from cold storage to hot storage efficiently and safely um, and give your clients the ability to move those digital assets around by still keeping them safe? Um, and, and that's what a lot of custodians are wrestling with now. Um, and then it comes back to how good is your cybersecurity? How good are those procedures? Um, how easy is it to move things from cold storage to hot storage? Do it efficiently so it doesn't affect the client experience. And I think cold storage custody of crypto assets is something that many players in this industry are really in need of. We've seen the exploits, the hacks, the breaches, where they're just keeping money online in a hot wallet, and someone doesn't even penetrate the system. They're just a very knowledgeable, advanced computer programmer, maybe, and they call some functions that affect one end of the system, where it completely drains the other end of the system into their wallet. So given you know those events that play out, and we see it happen time and time again in the, in, in the cryptocurrency industry, do you think we will see the markets react in maybe either a positive or negative way once there are more digital asset custodians in the space? I mean, I think it's going to be uh, nothing but positive when it comes to that, right? Because it means that the digital asset space has taken security of digital assets seriously. I think that's what investors are looking for. That's what institutional um, clients and entities are looking for. And that's what regulated entities are looking for. Uh, most uh, these regulated entities, that um, they have a fiduciary duty to their clients that forces them to hold assets with a qualified custodian. Um, so uh, back to the point I was making earlier, I, I think it will only expand the digital asset world, um, the cryptocurrency world, the BSV world, once you have a real adoption and an understanding of what qualified custodians can do for the industry. And, and I'm happy you said that because I think maybe a problem we see in the cryptocurrency industry and in BSV as well is that sometimes I see individuals and businesses trying to create solutions and sell solutions into an industry that they haven't been part of. But I'm happy you have this, this finance experience, this banking experience, because you've seen some of the most pressing problems those industries have. So can you tell us about some of those pressing problems that you notice take place in the finance industry? And then maybe tell us a little bit about trust chains and you know how what you guys are doing to provide one solution to those problems. Yeah. So I, I think the biggest thing that the blockchain technology itself does, it gives immutability to the entire ecosystem. So every trade that's done, every quote that's made, every every price that's done, every click that's made on a screen um, can be put on the blockchain. So it's immutable, it's there, it's auditable. So that makes things much clearer for regulators. It makes things much clearer um, for investors, for traders, for everyone involved. Um, and I think that to me, 
that's one of the largest problems with finance in general. It's it's trust, right? Does the investor have trust that this platform is pricing them correctly? Does the investor have trust that their assets are safe, right? So that's to me what that's what the blockchain does. It gives the investor, it gives the entire ecosystem a level of trust that things are being done the way these people are saying they're being done. And you can check it, right? It's on chain. Um, now, to that point, there's only one blockchain that can really do that, right? There's only one that's in our eyes that's scalable enough to do that. And that's BSV, where you can put everything on chain, every single quote, and it's commercially feasible to do that. It's scalable to do that. Um, and, and so we've done research into different chains. And so Trust Chains has made a decision to build a qualified custodian 100% on the BSV blockchain. Okay, There are no other custodians out there that are doing that right now or that have done that. They've done pieces of it, Okay, but nobody's actually done that. So it's our goal, our end goal to build a true qualified multi-asset custodian. So not just digital assets, not just crypto, but we're talking every single asset and, and tokenize it on the BSV blockchain. That gives clients incredible transparency right? and, and opens them up to another world where they can take their assets and do a lot more things with them. That That's our goal to trust chains. And like you said, you guys did research into many other chains before deciding where the proper chain to build your solution would be. So maybe throughout that research of those other chains, what were some of the factors that prevented you from saying this one's right for us? Or if you did try to attempt it to build the solution on another chain, what ultimately made you pivot to a, a different chain? Yeah, great question. Um, and one that's uh, we get all the time. And the answer is very, very simple for us. Um, so even as you're building, quote unquote, disruptive technologies, right? The goal should always be as a commercial enterprise to generate revenue, right? So that's our point of departure for everything we do is we want to change the, the qualified custodian system for the better, but we want to generate revenue for our shareholders, for our clients, for our employees. So if that's our point of departure, then we have to use a blockchain that does that best for us, right? So when you look at BSV and how scalable it is, and more importantly, the cost to do business on the BSV blockchain, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer for us, right? So, you know, all other things considered, we kept coming back to that, hey, is this the best blockchain? Yes, because it has everything we need and it's scalable and commercially it makes sense for us. Do you see any obstacles on the horizon or in the future or what sort of what's what sort of bump in the road needs to be overcome before more people maybe turn their eyes to a blockchain solution, maybe a custody solution that's built on chain? Do you see any trouble or anything that still needs a bit of problem solving? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, um, and I saw a bit of this at the CoinGeek conference in New York recently, where there was a panel with Donnie Deutsch, um, and he spoke about use cases. Right? He spoke about things won't really get adopted on a mass scale until there are real use cases for people, for institutions, um, for everyone. So to me, I think that's the biggest thing that we're focused on right now is actually building things on the blockchain that are useful, right? Now you 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 have things that are great, like you know you've got crypto fights, you've got all these 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 this this gaming focus, right? But you've got to, in our eyes, you've got to expand past that, right? You've got to build true financial products based on the blockchain, um, and BSV is perfectly positioned to do that. Um, but you need people that are focused on building out those use cases and, and more importantly, utilizing the technology um, that's existing and new technology that will come focused on the BSV blockchain. Um, you know, we, we, we talk to James Belding at Tokenized all the time. We love what he's doing there. Um, when you look at the use cases he's working on, um, I think he's a perfect example of the direction that BSV can go in. 
right? He's a perfect example of it. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do as well. I think that was an excellent sort of a summary of what needs to take place for maybe more attraction or to see more people be successful in their sort of blockchain endeavors. I think as I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in, uh, in this conversation, I see a lot of people trying to sell solutions into industries that they haven't been a part of, or maybe create solutions to problems that don't really exist. But I think you nailed it. When the solutions being created have like real world use cases in industries where it's a legitimate problem that people experience time and time again, I think solving for that is what p puts people on the road to success, the track to success. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. I think that that's exactly it. You, you've got to solve a problem and solve it utilizing the BSV or, or whatever blockchain works best for you. For us, it's BSV. For us, we've seen the problem, right? The problem is there's a lack of a true qualified custodian for the digital asset space, right? There, there are companies that do it here and there and do pieces of it, but we're trying to bring, bring together the entire ecosystem under a true qualified custodian that's built on the blockchain, right? To me, that's the ultimate goal, but that takes time, right? That takes time. So at Trust Chains, we're focused on going after that, that license, but in the short term, you know, we have tons of clients that come to us on a daily basis, hey, we're looking to get into the crypto space, we don't know how to do it. Um, so we offer them advisory services, we've built partnerships, um, with a ton of players in the BSV space, in, in the traditional finance space, to be able to start to pull that together in advance of getting that, that license. And Jermaine, just my final sort of question to wrap up uh, our chat today, which I really enjoyed, is if there was one sort of general takeaway that you would want the audience to know about the digital asset markets and custodianship, what would that general takeaway be? I think the biggest takeaway for me is um, the the market and specifically BSV is at an inflection point right now, right? So I think it can go in a couple different ways. Um, and the biggest thing for us is for people to understand that it doesn't have to be anti-regulation, right? Blockchain, BSV, digital assets, don't have to be anti-regulation, right? You can work within a regulated environment, you can lean into regulation, and that actually helps that mass adoption. Um, that gives some real gravitas and some real uh, legitimacy to what, what we're doing in the blockchain space. Um, so to me, that's the biggest takeaway is um, we need to get to that point. We're here now, now we have to go in a certain direction. Um, and to me, that direction is let's lean into regulation. Um, let's build out the qualified custodian space focused on BSV, um, on the technology, using that technology. Um, and I think eventually what we'll see is the utility of BSV will, will kind of out trump everything else that's out there, which, which a lot of it's just noise, right? I think that was really nicely put. Jermaine, I'd like to thank you again so much for taking the time to Join us today and share your insights. Thank you, Patrick, and, and, and keep up the good work at CoinGeek. I hope you enjoyed all of the insight that Jermaine shared with us in this episode. I'd like to take a second to look at the key takeaways from our conversation. Number one, many institutional players cannot trade or hold crypto because they are in need of a qualified custodian. Number two, what can catalyze blockchain adoption is building a solution with real world use cases and leading into regulation and legal frameworks. Each of these elements give blockchain networks and products legitimacy. And number three, a blockchain is a good tool to solve the problems related to trust that are often experienced in the world of banking and finance. I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in and watched today's episode about custodianship and using the blockchain to solve real world problems. My name is Patrick Thompson, and I hope to see you back for the next episode of More Than Money.